Hi everyone, this is Casey with Foundation Testing and Consulting. The purpose of today's video is to provide an overview of the various common drilled shaft non-destructive test methods that are available. Uh, as I mentioned in the introductory video to this channel, I performed cross hole sonic logging and other drilled shaft tests for 22 plus years on literally over 15,000 drilled shafts at this point. Most of those tests have involved cross-hole sonic logging. So the methods I'll cover in today's video as a brief overview is cross-hole sonic logging or CSL testing, sonic echo impulse response testing, and thermal integrity profiling. Now, based on my experience, I would say cross-hole sonic logging is the best and prevalent method for non-destructive testing for drilled shafts. It's been around in the United States well over 22 years. It's used primarily on Department of Transportation bridge projects. It's a construction phase test to assess the overall quality of the drill shaft concrete placement. This test involves the installation of typically two inch diameter steel access tubes. They're tied to the main reinforcing cage and then the concrete's placed in the shaft. And after a sufficient amount of curing, which is typically anywhere from two to seven days, the CSL test is conducted using a pair of probes lowered to the bottom of the tubes. These tubes are water filled and then you have a data acquisition system and you're recording data essentially every two inches along the length of the shaft, every two inch vertical interval. And uh, you use the same methodology for all the available two pair combinations uh, for a drill shaft. So for example, a four tube shaft would have six combinations, a six tube shaft would have 15 combinations and so on. The number of access tubes is determined by the diameter of the shaft. So for four or five foot diameter shafts, typically four CSL tubes would be adequate. For four and a half to say six foot diameter shafts, six tubes would be appropriate. And then anywhere from six and a half to even 12 foot diameter shafts, uh, eight tubes would be plenty. Now I've seen jobs where they had a 13, 14 foot diameter shaft and they want, wanted 14 tubes, that's, that's overkill. That's an excessive number of combinations. It's just not really necessary. But just keep this more on a general front for this video. The idea with the cross hole sonic log test is you're sending an ultrasonic pulse. Usually a comp it's a compression wave with a frequency of the probes at around 43,000 hertz. And you're looking for variations in the signal strength and the arrival time at a given point along the length of the shaft. So for typical good quality concrete, compression wave speed is around 11,000 to 13,000 feet per second. So for the CSL test, you're looking for discrete zones where the energy and drops and the arrival time increases, which would indicate a lower velocity. So you can go all the way down to say 5,000 feet per second velocity, which is indicative of say a water filled gravel if the cement paste washed out from the concrete during placement. And then somewhere on the order of eight to 9,000 feet per second. That's usually indicative of just slightly lower quality concrete. There may be some honeycombing, uh, loss of cement paste, loss of some of the fine aggregate and so on. So in subsequent videos, I'll go through what are the typical issues with drill shaft placement where anomalies typically occur. And we call anomalies any place where the CSL test or another test method indicates that there might be an issue with the quality of the concrete used for the shaft placement. Next we have sonic echo impulse response testing. This test is usually done for drill shafts or large diameter cast in place concrete pile where there's no installed access tubes. The resolution of this test method compared to CSL is a lot less, but it can give you an overall idea of shaft quality if there's any variations in diameter, either a neck or a bulge. It has a lot of limitations if you have, say, a drill shaft with a rock socket because typically the compression wave will be reflected off that bedrock interface so you won't be able to resolve any portion of the drill shaft below the top of rock. And sometimes it's used for auger cast piling and the length to diameter ratio could be quite large such that you don't resolve the bottom of the pile. But this is a good methodology, particularly in conjunction with CSL testing, let's say CSL testing identifies a potential anomaly and uh, maybe there's some issues with leaky access tube pipes or something like that where 
it causes a reduction in signal, but perhaps uh, the analyst doesn't think there's an issue with the drill shaft per se. So the sonic echo method is a very good test in that regard to determine, hey, is this an isolated zone or is it more widespread within the shaft cross section? And the nice thing about this test is since it doesn't involve pre-installed access tubes, you're able to do the test at any time as long as you have access to the top of the concrete in order to swing a hammer and attach your instrumentation which is typically uh, an accelerometer and a geophone. We collect our data using a three channel system uh, manufactured by Olson Instruments. And then you have thermal integrity profiling. We've done a few thousand shafts using this method. Uh, I think it has primary value as a secondary test to CSL testing. I do not at all advocate using thermal integrity profiling as a primary test method because there's a lot of limitations associated with it. And the idea is that you've got, you have these thermistors that are spaced 12 inches along the length of the wire and the wires are installed to the inside of the reinforcing cage, much as you would have for the CSL pipes if you were doing CSL. And uh, the wired method is the primary method. In the early days when we started doing this in 2015, uh, we were mostly uh, using the probe method. And in that instance, you'd have to evacuate the water from the CSL pipes and use the thermal probes to do the data collection for their thermal integrity profiling analysis. Uh, but uh, the wire methods uh, tends to be more popular these days and you pair it with uh, data acquisition boxes that are cloud enabled and you're able to retrieve the data, data remotely in real time, which is nice. Biggest problem with thermal integrity profiling is there's a lot of things that can cause variation in measured concrete temperature within a drill shaft as the cement cures, the, the heat of hydration that's generated. The idea with a thermal integrity profiling test is they're looking for lower temperature zones that would perhaps be indicative of a lower density zone of the concrete or a smaller diameter or an area where there was loss of cover. Uh, the problem with the method is that you can have variations in temperature that are strictly related to ambient temperature variations. So difference, differences in groundwater elevation, uh, differences in the thermal conductivity of the adjacent soil and rock layers. All these things can cause a uh, variation in temperature that has nothing to do with concrete quality. So as I said, my advice is to use thermal integrity profiling in instances as a supplement to CSL testing. We recently did a job where there was a lot of overbreak in the rock socket in shale. And it was interesting that the thermal integrity profiling identified these oversized zones by a pretty dramatic increase in temperature. Of course, the contractor suspected this was the case because they had overage in concrete volume of probably 25, 30% over theoretical. So we, they knew that they were putting a lot more concrete than what would have been indicated by the nominal diameter of the shaft. But again, my company performs this whole range of testing for drill shafts and pile. So if you have particular questions, reach out to me. We uh, do review other people's work on a consulting basis uh, in order to form a second opinion. And uh, we have extensive experience with both design and construction observation of drill shafts. So we don't merely just tell you whether you have an anomaly, or, but we tell you, is it a real shaft issue? And what likely was the cause? And then things you can do to address that issue to satisfy the design requirements and the owner's requirements. So that's the overview. If you like this kind of content, I'd appreciate it if you would like and even share with your colleagues this video. And please stay tuned for future topics as we go into a variety of areas for deep foundation testing. Thanks very much.